What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Paul Tedesco of Track. You can find him at Track OMC. And Paul, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. People can check out Jan Kessel. And Paul may say a few words about Jan Kessel. That was a great uh, interview, The Power of Data in Business. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today as well. Um, also, Devin McDonald, um, and we'll talk a little about Devin, and also Michelle Prince. Uh, we were just talking about uh, Paul has a book in him that will eventually come out. <clears throat> Maybe when you're listening to this, it's out. So I was talking about Michelle Prince and performance publishing. That She makes it easy for people to do that, and there's a really good episode of you know, some of her best tips and, and tricks and um, you know, there's another one that uh, Kevin Hurrigan was another good one. Paul, I know you've been in the agency space for, I won't age you a couple decades, but Kevin also started his agency in 1995. Um, so it's interesting to hear his journey of the internet, the agency space and business in general, kind of the ups and downs. Um, so that was a very interesting one. Kevin's at Spinia Tech. So check those out and many more. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25, we help businesses Give to and connect their dream relationships and partnerships. Uh, how do we do that? We do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. So, Paul, we're kind of like the magic elves that run in the background and make it look easy for the host and the company so they can run their company and develop amazing relationships and create amazing content at the same time. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships, and I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Paul Tedesco. He's president of TRAC and currently heads up the North American operations of TRAC DDB, a leading data technology analytics agency They focus on data-driven marketing for clients, such as you've heard of McDonald's, Kraft, Mercedes-Benz, Samsung, and many more. Paul has spent over 30 years in marketing and focuses, this is what he focuses on, using data, technology, and analytics to deliver the right message to the right customer at the right time. In addition, Paul teaches customer value creation and marketing analytics at uh, MBA program, the Groot School of Business. and he's part of the MBA faculty. So, Paul, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jeremy. It's great to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. So, Jan and Devin, just to uh, speak for a second. Well, I feel uh, I feel in great company being with uh, on your podcast when those two have both been on your podcast. So, I'll I'll tell you that Jan Kessel is probably, from a Canadian standpoint, she's our pioneering voice when it comes to using data. I would say there's probably not a client we have that we don't work closely with Enveronix. In fact, so closely that they're two floors away from us in our building. Um, And she mentioned uh, Tony Lee when she was on your podcast, the late Tony Lee. Um, And I would say that for me personally, first of all, he's probably the smartest man I've ever met. Um, And personally, a real inspiration to me on how you can use data and marketing uh, and make it understandable and relatable for your average person. Because I think that's still one of the challenges we have, right? We're like lawyers where uh, we've created all these incredible sets of terminology and we're going to normalize and bifurcate the data um, so that people, um, you know, so we've created this nomenclature. Tony was always just amazing at getting right to the point, making it clear and making it easy. A true inspiration to me and, and we miss him. Uh, and then you mentioned Devin, uh, Devin McDonald, who has been a, come a great friend, actually worked for me, I think probably 20 years ago. And by the way, at the beginning you said, and if I'm talking too fast, immediately just put up your hand and tell me to, to go slow. I have this incredible, um, um, desire to get as much in, in, in a minute as I possibly can. Talk um, as fast as you want. I usually listen to things in three times speed. So maybe yours, <laughs> I listen to them too. So you're good. 
Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning you weren't going to date me, and then you talked about my over 30 years in this business. Uh, so you have dated me. About 20 years ago, Devin, um, who comes from a consulting background, uh, worked with me at a company called Kenna. Um, and he was one of my uh, kind of group account directors managing um, some business. And I have to tell you that not only is he just one of the most amazing people I've ever met and has become a great friend, but he's also just, uh, you know, I, I think I was mentioning if there's one person and you said to me, one person, Paul, who worked for you and you helped get a start that you would feel totally comfortably working for now, um, it would be Devin McDonald, one of the, the most amazing men, smart, uh, ethical. He's got everything that it takes. So both of those sections of your podcast were incredible. And I feel in great company, just the fact that I'm here with them. No, thanks for sharing that. And those, they did share some amazing stories and lessons there. Um, Paul, talk about track and, and what you do. And, and if someone's listening and listening, there is a video part and we're going to I'll pull up uh, the website. So um, uh, track and it's OMC, actually not DDB, but that's OK. We've messed that up uh, before. Um, you know, track was birthed uh, by actually Stan Rapp and Tom Collins. It used to be part of, of Rapp. So it was a direct marketing company 13 years ago when I started uh, we were a direct mail agency and we have followed, uh, and by the way, direct mails make, and if you want to talk about it later, we can direct mails making an incredible company. I love direct mail. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I actually, you know, spent almost a year having some of the top direct response marketers, copywriters on the planet on. So I, I geek out on, on direct mail. I mean, think about, sorry, I'm digressing one second from track. I'm going to talk about direct mail. But if you think about as marketers, the way we ruin every single opportunity we get to have great relationships and, and mediums to talk to our, our, our customers on. And direct mail is a prime example where we absolutely, um, you know, spammed uh, people's mailboxes to the point that it was just impossible to get a message through. And of course, that era is over. And now with incredible targeting and, and being able to do that, we can be specific. Now imagine that we have an entire generation of people who don't even know what mail is. And now all of a sudden we have an opportunity to give them a tangible tactical experience by providing them with something that they can get through, um, through the mail. So I'm really excited about the future of direct mail. We're never going to have, you know, one year I worked on MBNA um, at one point in time and in Canada with a population at the time of about 35 million people, I think we sent um, at about, 12 million households. I think we sent out 40 million direct mail pieces in Canada one year for MBNA, unaddressed drops. Um, and you know, now you can achieve the same results by sending out 20,000 direct mails because they can be extremely targeted and highly done. Sorry, I digressed. No, off. I actually have a question on that mm -hmm. all from the direct mail. Are there any people in the that you respect um do you consider kind of pioneers in direct mail or a favorite direct mail campaign at the time that we could learn from yeah i so my favorite uh direct mail of all time uh was done by subaru it was actually done by ddb um but it was done by subaru and i wish i had it if i was in my office i could have showed it to you um but what happened was it was one of those old air, air mail envelopes i don't know if you remember uh, the blue and used to write inside them and then send them via email, uh, airmail. And inside were a bunch of pictures and the pictures were of the development of a new Subaru vehicle. And, and literally it was like, somebody was saying, I got to get this message out there and I need to tell you about it because, um, it's so secret and so amazing. Um, and I think it was one of my, my favorite, uh, direct mail pieces. I don't know that most companies have made the 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 leap from what direct mail has been in the past to what direct mail is in the future but i know that uh, one of my favorite pieces of direct mail again that i i hold up is actually a piece i got from google which really seems strange because you know google being a digital based company is sending direct mail and i love it because you know obviously they're looking at me as a potential influencer for advertising and search and all of those things and they sent me this incredible direct mail piece um, that uh, it had a little premium in it. Um, and again, it got my attention. It was very effective. 
I was already sold on the power of Google, so I probably didn't necessarily need to, to get it, but I'm talking about it. And, uh, you know, as Seth Godin would say, um, it must be remarkable because Paul's making a remark about it. Yeah, I mean, it is telling, right? Google um, pretty much owns a lot of the uh, internet space and they're sending direct mail. I mean, same thing with Amazon. I mean, Amazon sends a bunch of direct mail. Um, they have, and Facebook too, um, yeah. but but their offer is compelling and, and uh, it helps when you're giving away free money. At least I've gotten those ones, like we'll give you X amount of dollars to advertise. So their offer is is compelling as well. We did a, um, sorry, I'm, I know I'm taking you totally off of what you asked me in the first place, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, we did a program. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Rocky Mountaineer. So the Rocky Mountaineer is a train in Canada, and it's got those cars that have, you know, the glass roofs. And basically it costs, you know, the price of the most expensive cruise you could ever take. And they take you through the Rockies, um, basically from Jasper to Vancouver. Um, and it's about four days. And uh, they came to us at one point in time, this is probably seven or eight years ago now, and said, we want to do a direct mail campaign, or sorry, we want to, uh, they didn't ask for a direct mail campaign. They came to us and said, we need to effectively target Los Angeles. And their budget was six figures. So it it wasn't, it was well under a million dollars. And it was kind of like, okay, you know, the largest, potentially one of the largest markets in in the world and you want to target it with what is the budget that potentially Spokane is, is your target. And um, they kind of said, what should we do? So great tie-in um, because we use the same data set that, that um, and Veronics uses, it's called Prism. And we use that, uh, that data set. We took existing customers uh, of the Rocky Mountaineer, people who'd gone on the Rocky Mountaineer, and we um, basically found neighborhoods, so by zip code, we created targeting by neighborhood. And what we did is we took 80,000 households in um, Los Angeles. We sent 20,000, uh, took 20,000 as a holdout group, took 20,000 TV only. So we did one of the very first campaigns where we did TV by zip code. We did, um, uh, we did direct mail in 20,000 and we did TV and direct mail in 20,000 and TV and direct mail together resulted in almost 60% of the volume of people booking um, uh, actual trips. And by the way, 100% of the trips booked from Los Angeles came from those 60,000 that received contact and the combination of TV and direct mail, it's tactical and it stays in your hands and someone goes, I'd like to take this cruise, but maybe I'm not ready yet. Maybe I want to take it in two years. They put it in a file, they post it on the board, they put it in a cupboard and they can come back to it. And that's the power of, of direct mail that you can't achieve on any digital ad uh, or email. I love that. Paul, what was effective, do you remember, about that direct mail piece? or components of that in the TV? What was effective inside of like with the messaging and everything? Yeah, so we created, um, uh, I think it was very aspirational. Obviously you can imagine the target market we got, people who have some money, people who are a little older. Um, and, and again, we didn't do that purposely. We let the data drive us there because what we did is we looked at neighborhoods that had traveled on the Rocky Mountaineer in Los Angeles and we used the data uh, uh, to actually model out uh, lookalike neighborhoods is kind of how we found those. So we found lookalike neighborhoods from a demographic standpoint, an interest standpoint, um, an income standpoint. Uh, so all of those things. What was really effective, us, I think, is that we created a story in a 30-second spot. Uh, DDB created a story in a 30-second spot. And we, as track, then created kind of the extension of that story. So someone who had seen it on TV would get the direct mail and go, oh my God, let me check that out. Oh, geez, look, uh, this is how, how long it takes. And these are the amazing places it goes. And these are the hotels you're going to stay at. And these are all the things that are involved. So I think the, the tie-in between the two mediums and even the timing of our delivery of the piece made it really, really effective. Yeah, Paul, it's interesting. So I had a uh mentor colleague friend brian kurtz on and he i think is 
sent out like over 2 billion pieces of direct mail in his lifetime. And, and I remember him saying one time, Facebook did not invent lookalike audiences. Just like you said, you did <laughs> lookalike audiences based on, you know, what you were seeing in different zip codes, right? So everything you're saying, what I love about it is kind of the the groundwork and fundamentals for direct response marketing anywhere, whether you're on Google, Facebook, or anywhere online too. Yeah, I mean, the the principles haven't changed. What's changed is the technology and capabilities, right? I mean, uh, I, uh, I used to manage the Dove Canada database and it was 80,000 names. And now I'm really going to date myself because it was in a Lotus 123 spreadsheet. Um, and and literally at that point in time, we would use demographic data similar to and and I don't remember Ann Veronics at that point in time. They they might have been there and doing it, or maybe it would have been um, her previous company who was helping us. But we would actually take our own database and be able to segment it out using that data to understand kind of what the potential is. Is this person potentially in a family? Can we love uh, launch of men to them? If they're buying a woman's product, you know, how does that work? And I think the the basic principles haven't changed. It's just the incredible magnitude and exponential change in our capabilities that have allowed us to um, uh, to become really, really personal. I want to talk about how you got into the agency world, but we have to talk about some takeaways from selling toilet paper. Oh, my goodness. Um so it's funny, and here's, I'll give you a recommendation. So my father, before he passed away, uh, he was um, lived in Italy during the war, came over and emigrated after the, uh, after the war. And I got him to sit down and write all his stories, 18 single space pages of all his stories. I'm now leading mine on to video. Um, but I have to tell you that, so I was a, um, I started out in sales after I graduated from school. I worked for Scott Paper, as you said. Um, and And what I learned there is that you can become any single product, if you put it into the right perspective, can become a passion point for what you do. I loved and still some of my best memories are, are selling toilet paper. And I, I won't get into too many stories on, um, on it, but those were the days, because this is now 35 years ago, maybe even more. Um, and in those days, you used to be able to knock on doors. I sold industrial, so toilet paper into things. My funniest story is I, so the Sky Dome, um, as it was called in Canada at the time, is the home of the Blue Jays. Of course. I sold the contract for the toilet paper in the Sky Dome. And literally, I sold those big, we called them JRT. They were jumble roll tissues. Like this is one where you could go back and forth on the field 12 times, the, the thinnest single ply you could ever imagine. And I sold this into the, the Sky Dome. And I'm actually there on opening night. Um, sitting in 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 some seats, watching as people go to the washroom and and consume <laughs> our our product. See, you can get passionate about anything. I um I get a call the next morning. We had a bullpen style sales uh place, and I get a call the next morning, and literally it's like Paul Tedesco line one, and I pick up the phone, um, and it's the general manager of the Blue Jays who asked me if I was at the game, and they they literally people were ripping off the covers, taking the big jumbo rolls on the upper level and trying to throw them down to unravel. And of course, they're just breaking away. We're really lucky nobody got uh, got hurt. But anyways, that's my to- one of my toilet papers. That's stores. actually, if if you had planned that, that would have been smart because then they would have to buy more and more toilet paper. Like, hey, you're whispering in the fan's ear, go take this off and start using it as streamers through the stadium. So I, I literally, the phone call said, uh, you have 24 hours to fix this. And, uh, and we got a welding shop to make these metal brackets that go over, went over top. And I literally was there as they were being delivered, me and me and seven other people. And we went to every single toilet paper roll, uh, toilet paper dispenser in the sky dome. And we, we literally manually riveted these things on and bolted these things on. So it couldn't be done. I'm always curious, Paul, about selling. That's a pretty, funny story and that's a big account on people selling what seems to be a commodity like item how do you compete and how do you sell a stadium when like okay this toilet paper versus this toilet paper yeah i mean um it's tough because it is in many ways a a commodity uh commodity product i think 
you know, there's an element of because at the time, and again, this is a long time ago, that those big toilet paper dispensers were an innovation and trademarked, right? So there was an ability to say, we can save you a lot of money um, and your people having to go and actually put new rolls of toilet paper onto the normal dispenser. Um, so we had an innovation. We had a, 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 a point of difference um, that added value to the relationship that, uh, or, or the, the, to, to the sky dome, as far as being able to manage that aspect of their, um, um, of their operations. No, I, I appreciate that. Cause even in the agency world, you know, some people can perceive someone creating websites, right? There's a lot of people that do certain things, but I like you pointed out what innovation do you have? And also what's a point of difference from other companies? Well, it's, uh, you know, there is no, there is not much, there is not much greater a commodity than an, than a marketing agency. In in so many of our of of uh, you know a CMO for instance kind of looks around and says, you know in the old days uh, you know Bill Bernbach could point to um, uh, or Leo Burnett could point to his his incredible advertising. He was so much smarter. I think today that has really become uh, much more commoditized. Um, for me, the key I just talk about retention. The number one word at track is retention from an internal standpoint. And it starts with retention of our employees um, because there's nothing that that sours a relationship with a client faster than turnover of the staff on their account. If you can retain and keep great employees, um, then they will help you retain and keep great clients because it's hard to show a benefit to change. Um, and, you know, so many RFPs and things that we get today are all focused on, on price, right? How do we create, how do we create a, um, a system or a program where we can get the best price uh, out of you? You know, we're fortunate because we have, I think it's the best client list I've ever seen um, at an agency period bar none. Um, I am biased, however, I will admit, Jeremy. Uh, but. Um, you know, to me, the key is to keep them. If I can keep them and grow, uh, then that's the the output. Because Track has had a nice steady growth. We were eight people 13 years ago. We're about 90 now. And we've had a nice, slow, progressive growth. And even our core clients like um, McDonald's and Samsung, who have been with us from almost the beginning, I have like a 13-year relationship with McDonald's. Um, they have continued to slowly grow as they trust us more and they allow us to to help them more. And uh, retention is the key in my mind. Talk about that for a second, staff retention. What are some of the things you and the, and the teams you've worked with that's helped from a, a staff retention standpoint? Yeah, I think, you know, there's two. So I think our secret, um, and I would say we're not the highest paying agency um, in the business. We're competitive. Uh, I wouldn't say to you that people come to us just because uh, they want to work at track and they'll take half the money. That's not true. Um, our turnover, though, we've been very fortunate that our turnover over the last um, uh, the last five or six years is is in the single digits, low single digits. Um, we very seldom lose anybody, one or two people a year out of out of ninety, uh, which is a pretty good um, which is a pretty good number. Um, I think we do two things uh, that that separate us from the uh, the crowd. And I will tell you, I'm an evangelist of a book called The Service Profit Chain and a method called The Service Profit Chain. Um, and if you haven't read it, or I teach it, as a matter of fact, uh, as well. And Len Schlesinger who's a professor at um, Harvard, Babson College maybe, but but uh, at Babson um, actually taught it to me. And it just talks about how employees, if you create value for employees, they create value for uh, your clients. So I live by, by that. So two things that I'd say uh, separate us. One is trust. So we, we trust our people to make decisions, to do things. Um, and we stand behind them no matter what they do. My team will tell you that no matter what mistake or whatever happens, as long as we learn from it, that I'll be standing behind them, taking the blame. Um, I had a comment once from one of my account directors that uh, Paul gives us enough rope to hang ourselves, but he's always there with the chair um, to make sure we don't um, uh, do that. And then another one is respect. 
Um, I have to tell you that the only instantaneous terminations that I have done in the last uh, uh, 15 years of my career have been when someone yells and screams and is disrespectful. We don't tolerate it at all. So the idea of prima donna, people who think they know more than others and yell because something happened, doesn't happen at track ever um, because we wouldn't tolerate it. So you put trust and respect together and you've got an awful nice place to work. It helps, Jeremy, that we have the best client list in the entire industry. Who wants to leave a, a, an agency that's working with Samsung, McDonald's, JetBlue, and Mercedes? Nobody does uh, because they're the best brands in the world you could possibly work on. Yeah, you're doing cool work too. Um, from a trust perspective, from what are some of the things you do? I don't know if there's certain meeting cadence or, or things you do to build the trust of the team and to foster that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's really been interesting since COVID, obviously. Uh, we have a hybrid work scenario. We share the space with one of our sister companies called Critical Mass. And I don't know if you've ever uh, um, heard of them, but um, we share our space with Critical Mass. We're two days a week. Um, I think. Uh, you know, we do a, a number of different things, but what we, so part of the secret to our success is that my leadership team, the people that are leading track, um, because I can't say it's me, it's a team of, of, uh, of eight people. Um, they have with been with me on average eight years. So, uh, that inspires incredible, you know, loyalty inspires loyalty, trust inspires trust. Um, so we demonstrate and live uh our uh you know our mantras so i would say i respect everyone my team respects everyone therefore everyone respects each other um we exhibit the right behaviors and and the right things and we do from time to time take action um that demonstrates the fact that we actually do believe and live uh our core um trust is is uh uh as an organization we give trust probably before we earn it which is, I think, a big deal, right? Because I think people come in, they're brand new, they don't necessarily trust us. Uh, yeah, Paul, it's really nice that you said, if I make a mistake, just step up, be honest, we'll all jump behind you um, and make it happen. So what we do is we give the trust from the beginning and then we we live um, our values. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think the same way I was talking to someone about with referrals and like the best way to get referrals is to actually give referrals and don't necessarily expect to get referrals. So yeah. it's the same way with, with trust in a lot of things. You know, I have, um, and this, this one always blows people's minds. Sometimes my, uh, even, even the people, uh, that I work for, um, I've been in situations where someone's been in my office and said, uh, you know, I don't know if this is the right job for me. And I have said to them, listen, if it's not the right job for you, let me help you find the right job. I'm not going to fire you. I'm not going to make you quit. I'm not going to put those. Let me help you find the right thing for you and have moved people out of our company to other jobs at other companies, sometimes our competitors, because it was the right fit or a better fit uh, for them. That's a pretty bold thing to do to have a, a, you know, to have an environment where an employee can come to you and say, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. And you help them instead of uh, discouraging them. So how did you then get into the agency space? I know, uh, you, you know, from selling toilet paper and on. So, so um, I sold toilet paper <laughs> first and then I ended up running restaurants. So I went to a company called Restaurantics. I ran 19 cafeterias right there. People who'd run cafeterias and companies and schools and, and that, uh, that type of place. And I got headhunted by, uh, and I will do a call out, um, a company called Sabre. So this is now 32 years ago, a gentleman named Grant Rowe. Um, Sabre doesn't exist anymore, by the way. So I, if you're looking for it to put up, I don't think you can. And Grant Rowe pulled me out of running restaurants. Um, so I called up Scott Paper. I called on food, the food distributors. So I had this experience and he pulled me out because what he said was, we need someone who is so credible in the actual restaurant space, because they were a specialty boutique agency working on behalf of Kraft and Campbell's um, and Kellogg's selling into restaurants. We need someone so credible that you can sit in front of the head chef at the Four Seasons 
and have a discussion on food cost. And um, and he hired me away from that and into the agency world. And I have not looked back. So Grant and I didn't always agree on everything, but I credit him with what has been a, a 32-year career where I can count the number of days I didn't want to go to work on one hand. It is. This is the most exciting, amazing place to be, especially in the data CRM space, which is the best place to be. What are some of the things you talk about? I know you teach an MBA course, um, and one of the things you talk about is customer value creation. Mm -hmm. It's um, so. I mean, the first thing we have to understand and know about uh, customer value is uh, it's an exchange. So I think where we get it wrong so often is that companies go on a bent to say, how can I create value, create value, create value? And I think the, the problem is that we don't often think enough about the extraction of value. And if you if you think about, I, what, did I say I wasn't going to say that word? I think I did say I wasn't going to say that word. Um, you know, value is a two-way street. And, and the goal then should be, how do we, we take that value uh, that we deliver and build and, and get value back? So we call it value delivered and value received. The second thing is, that value is really easy to define and measure when you're the brand or the company. And it's impossible to define and measure when you're the consumer. You know, I think about the fact, so I have a MacBook uh, computer. That's only because Samsung computers haven't been sold in Canada until the last two years. But I have a MacBook uh, computer. And, you know, I love it. And part of the reason I love it is because I love the Genius Bar. I love being able to go to the Genius Bar and get my, my stuff fixed, right? There are other people who thrive on the ecosystem. I don't. I'm a Spotify guy, not an Apple Music guy. Um, I don't need uh, the ecosystem. Then there are other people um, that potentially are just in the ease of use, right? It's it's a Mac. It's just easier to use. It's not as hard. I don't have to worry about the prompt at the DOS prompt. I'm kidding. By the way, I know there's no such thing as a DOS prompt anymore, um, but I don't have to worry about that. So what we know is that if you're selling to these three people, they have a whole different idea of what's value. I have to tell you that ecosystem means nothing to me. So zero value in the Paul camp on uh, on ecosystem. So when if you start to think about then that perception is real is it, value is a perceptive um, it has a perceptive value and everyone's is different. It's impossible to measure. So what does that mean? If we can't measure it and we can't necessarily see it as easy. We have to figure out a way to deliver it on a one-to-one -one value. And finally, the world is ready for that, right? Like, like the, the data environment has become, and the, tech not, uh, and the tech environment has become so rich in its capabilities that we can now actually look at individuals and say, how do we deliver the right value for Jeremy exclusively? And what does that mean? We don't waste any. Right. So we don't give value to Jeremy that he doesn't care about, but we give Paul the value that he wants when um, when it's necessary. And that goes into the analytics piece and the personalization personalization mm -hmm. piece. So talk about, you know, again, another thing you talk about with your company and also in the MBA courses is the marketing analytics. Yeah. And I think again, the the um the ability for us to to capture uh, data on an individual basis allows us to create personalization. And if you start to think about a McDonald's, for instance, right? Why would we be spending the time trying to market a Happy Meal to someone who has no children? Um, and on the simplest level, that is a, is, is, is a core- Because adults uh, like the toy too? Yeah, that's- no, the, Or they want the value, the, the deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> adults like the toy. So if you start to think about that, what happens if 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 a brand starts to send me uh, emails um, or direct mail or text messages or target me on digital media or social media um, for an item that I don't want? I start to create a, um, a filter where I start to take that brand out of my consideration set. Oh, obviously McDonald's isn't for me. They're trying to sell me something I don't want. Obviously Samsung isn't for me. They're trying to give me something that I'm not interested. I rent a place. I don't need appliances. So by using the data that we have and are available and by targeting on a more one-to-one -one level, you know, we can provide the information that's necessary. We have a, um, 
a rule in our year annual planning that we want to try to go to all of our clients and say, how do we do less? So if we're currently sending 10 million emails a year to our client base, how do we make that seven? By making the seven more relevant and cutting out the waste. How do we, and, and that makes us more efficient and effective, right? Because if we're, if we're not sending those 3 million emails out, we're saving money. We're providing a better experience for our client and are more engaging and they engage with us better and it, and it's good on, but we're also saving money, which is the same philosophy now. I mean, obviously first party data, especially with the future of cookies has become something huge in, in our world because every client we have is how do we come become more media efficient using first party data? And the same thing applies. It's really almost more about suppression than it is about anything else. It's how do we take the people we don't need to talk to and not talk to them. Um, and that way we're not wasting that money over there in a space that we don't have to. Yeah, Paul, I love that about how to do less cutting out the waste. And sometimes it's even counterintuitive, right? So be like, well, how can we send more emails? How can we do this? But for you, it's more very targeted. And so it's, you know, trimming off the fat. Um, talk about McDonald's, and I know that you've, you've worked, and the company's worked with McDonald's for a long time, and we were talking before you hit record about personalization and more personalization. Yeah, I mean, um, the real uh, uh, turning point for McDonald's was the uh, the introduction of the rewards program, where now, of course, what we're doing is we're we're able to understand a person's specific habits and and a person specific purchase patterns and and the basket etc that they want to so again um you know to make it to make it really simple um when we have that kind of knowledge and and McDonald's is a, is retail as a whole so whether it's a supermarket or um uh sorry whether it's a grocery store or an airline someone who collects first party data this isn't as easy for CPG companies because they don't do the transactions but if you get a company that does transactions what they can do for instance is take a look and say hey paul um seems to like to go out for lunch on fridays he likes to grab a coffee every morning and every once in a while on a saturday afternoon he's taking um his family uh in my case it's actually my elderly mother um into mcdonald's for a for a burger cuz i have to admit that I love McDonald's, uh, not only as a client, but as a uh, as, as something I do. So why in the world would we ever suggest to Paul that he should be coming in on Sundays, right? So personalization means we understand what Paul does. We will take some, some opportunities to see if we can't refine Paul's habits, right? Maybe we can get him to, you know, if he comes for coffee two days a week, maybe we can get him to come for coffee three days a week. But what it allows us to do is not um, intrude on Paul and the times he wants. The other thing that the loyalty program does, which is the, the biggest issue we have, I believe, in, in, in personalized marketing today is our ability to actually um, customize offers and the negative aspect of customizing offers. Because theoretically, and I'm not going to use McDonald's, McDonald's has never, I will state this out front, McDonald's has never even considered this. Okay, and they would never do it. But one of the problems that we had was that we were giving, for instance, everyone who bought Big Macs, we'd give them a dollar off a of Big Mac. Don't you think the person who potentially buys one every six months and gets a dollar off is not as valuable a customer as someone who buys uh, it does it twice a week? So how do we equate and give that person who comes twice a week the right amount of value? And and you weren't getting it because you just couldn't right? You just couldn't manage to get that done. The loyalty program allows that because everyone gets points. Um, everyone gets to kind of spend that. So that kind of personalization, um, you know, allows us to, to uh, give and provide things that are more relevant, more interesting, and more valuable to consumers at the right spot. I have seen it used nefariously. And again, McDonald's would never do that. And that is, we know Paul's going to come in for a Big Mac once a week. Uh, or hamburger once a week. We know Jeremy's not going to unless we give him a dollar. So we'll give Jeremy the dollar and not Paul. 
and that's nefarious. And McDonald's would never do that. Please don't cut that out of my uh, <laughs> my interview. <laughs> no, it is. It's interesting because it's um, more valuable, right? People feel special, and you're giving them a va- more valuable thing to you know because you have that data, right? Yeah. And you know, to, instead of trying to attract someone who doesn't use it, they're rewarding people who do uh, for certain activities, which makes sense. Um, from a so, thanks for sharing that because I think this applies to anything. I mean, anything in business, that concept of even if someone's trying to attract a new client as opposed to rewarding a existing loyal client and giving those people more valuable, exclusive, whatever it is um offers or um some other things that you can help them with well how how often and this is i know is one of the most frustrating uh things in my world anyways uh is you know how often do you see an incredible offer come up for potentially your cell phone service or your cable service or your internet service at home and you see something come up that says six months free and you sit there customers only yeah. New customers only. I've been a loyal customer for 30 years of your company and I get nothing. And someone brand new gets six months free. That's not right. And that's why a program like McDonald's has makes so much sense because it allows you to ensure that that loyalty, uh, oh, I hate that word, um, that uh, actually uh, continuity or someone who, who actually engages with you um, and is a great customer gets rewarded uh for that i want to talk also i know samsung um you have a deep relationship with samsung and you i'd love to talk about smart things i think uh this is amazing so we've just done a um uh so uh and if you look and and there are we've won a number of awards so there are some published cases on this but you know samsung was looking to improve its kind of social responsibility score and index and they were looking for ways for us to do it and i'm a big advocate uh so uh besides the one thing i already mentioned which is this laptop i'm on everything i own is samsung i got seven tvs all appliances um and and i've been very engaged with an app called smart things which is their kind of app that allows you to control stuff so you know when accidentally you get locked out of your uh you know your netflix and most people have to go find their password, not me. My Smart Things app has it all in it. I point at the, the QR code, everything comes back on to original settings. I control my garage door. I think you saw me, I controlled the blinds behind me. Everything is on Smart Things. And I'm a big advocate. And we were talking to someone in our office, and I take no credit for this idea, by the way. Um, all I did was advocate Smart Things. And, and um, they were talking about um, ADHD and, and we have an employee who has ADHD and, and they're actually in a, in a video that, that you can find online. If not now, it'll be on our website soon. And we started to talk about some of the challenges associated with ADHD. So what we did was we did a bunch of research. We partnered with, so 1.8 million Canadians uh, out of 40 million, 1.8 million Canadians um, have been diagnosed with ADHD, and that's probably not even the tip of the iceberg. So we partnered with something called called Possibilities, which is a leading um, advocate um, and researcher on ADHD. And we partnered with them, and we started to look and understand how we could enable and facilitate um, a better experience for people utilizing the Smart Things app. So we created Smart Things, Samsung Smart Things, and ADHD. Uh, We did a program on it. We did some websites. And basically, we did the first um, ADHD-enabled email that we've ever seen. Um, And it's simple things like where things, how many things will be above and below the on a page at one time. There's toggles for uh, icons versus text. There's, uh, you know, different, it's been enabled for, for being able to be read by a speech reader. So we basically took all of these things and enabled um, the app to be able to be more friendly for someone with ADHD. And it's a fantastic project. And that takes, I call it a brave client because it's pretty hard to um, monetize or understand the monetization of that. 
but it's got to be the thing that we are the most proud of as a as a team our clients at samsung and us we are so proud of it um that we did it no thanks for sharing that it kind of goes into the research and personalization and listening to the audience and all of that um, I have one last question, Paul, before I ask it, I want to just point people to check out more. They can check out trackomc.com to learn more. And my last question is just some of your favorite resources. It could be books. Um, I know you mentioned the service profit chain. I know as a, um, you know, teacher, uh, in the MBA program, I'd love to hear some of your favorite books of colleagues or in general. Yeah, I mean, I think different books for, so there's a lot of them, um, obviously that, uh, that are out today. Um, I'll tell you that when my kids, um, uh, first went off to, you know, I have four kids, uh, and, um, when they, uh, four grown ass kids, uh, who <laughs> the youngest is 19. One of the things that I've done to all of them is given them a copy of uh, the seven habits of highly effective people which I happen to think is probably been the most influential single book in my life. Um, I, I and, and I don't even know how old that is, Jeremy, but that book is not new. Um, it's old. Maybe 30 years old, maybe, maybe more. I've listened to it, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of the, I think it's one of the most incredible books ever because it actually um, uh, teaches you some usable, you know, I mean, some of these individual things like time boxing and stuff are fantastic, but the seven habits just gives you a real understanding of how to focus and how to do it. So if you think about me as a guy who who is on the faculty at a university, runs a company, um, does it have, uh, it, oh, it's uh, the anniversary edition, but Covey. Um, I don't know. To me, it's it gives you really usable skills that help you prioritize and focus. Um, and I use it, uh, I don't look at it anymore because it's ingrained, but I use it to plan my week. I use it to understand how to focus. I use it to understand how to prioritize. It has allowed me to come up with some great ways to say uh, no um, uh, and be able to do that. So it's a, um, it's my favorite uh, of all books. I love it. Paul, thanks again. Thanks for sharing your lessons and stories. Everyone check out trackomc.com and more episodes of the podcast and we'll see everyone next time paul thanks so much thank you so much jeremy it's been a real pleasure and appreciate your time what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side see nice like a beach if you find the same right now i'm feeling like a hundred grand